moment. O holy God, we ask that you take our minds and think with them, take our lips and speak with them, take our hands and work with them, and take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and all of creation. Amen. In the beginning, God creates. Five chapters later, God destroys. The Genesis narrative from our sacred scriptures, read so well by the father of the soon-to-be-baptized one, Joe, is a narrative, an indigenous creation origin narrative for the Hebrew people which was later adopted by we Christians. And starting with that spirit bird as wind that sweeps over, though deep, at the beginning. Now with this very true mythology, the story of Noah, which is long lifted in rainbowed Sunday school teachings, emerges, and it's a challenging one. It's both iconic, two by two animal preservation, and problematic. God killing off all of life on earth, save the contents of a floating ark. After carefully crafting creation in very good divine self-image, God returns to the potter's wheel and decides to scrap it all. Seeing only wickedness and violence in the hearts of humanity, God's heart is sickened and decides to wipe off all humans, plants, and animals from the face of the planet. Divine anger and sadness over the violence of humanity. Taking a direct cue from the even more ancient Mesopotamian mythology of Gilgamesh, the Noah's Ark story takes its familiar course from here. Climate chaos ensues, 40 days and 40 nights of rain. All is destroyed, yet the Ark is preserved. Now, as a church community that boldly hangs a banner on its storied steeple related to climate, we friends know all too well that our planet right now is experiencing 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Recent reminders, the floods and snows in California, the largest wildfire in Texas state history, and even closer to home that more than rain than snow winter that we've been experiencing are just some of the many signs of this human-caused and growing catastrophe. Uh, During Lent this year, when we are zoning in on bird power, it is even more painfully true to face the fact that since 1970, North America alone has lost three billion birds. I wanted to ignore this fact. I did not want one more downer for our worship service. But friends, that is a lot of power and a lot of wisdom that has gone missing. 90% of those losses are the familiar birds that we know so well, sparrows, red-winged blackbirds, meadowlarks, warblers, and finches. And now two out of three of every bird in Turtle Island are facing the risk of extinction. So like the time of Noah, humanity's wickedness and violence, this time to the rest of nature, seems way too real for us. Now today's narrative is about habitat loss in the form of a flood, And so our scriptures are making space for us to lament, lament our planet's hurt, and we need that. But today's story is also making space for the emergence of habitat once again. The raven and the dove ultimately find homes after the waters subside. One of the most powerful alignment of words in our scriptures, I feel, in these days. And God made the wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed and the rains from the heavens were restrained and the waters gradually receded from the earth. Climate jubilee. Something we long for, something we pray for, it's something we work for. But how do we get there? I'm going to suggest today that we follow the dove. Zanadia Makrura the morning dove. It is the most common of the doves in our local landscape here in the Northeast. 
And it is spelled with a U, mind you, not like for many years I thought. Morning as in that part of the day when the sun first comes. It is morning based on the vocalization of grief because of its cooing, its unique cooing. What a sacred cooing that is, right? In the mornings, we often hear the morning of the dove. And it's important for us, we've already named that, to make space for that lamentation. Even the birds accompany us in that. But I think we also need to follow Streptopelia tutura, the turtle dove, or more specifically the Oriental or European turtle dove, which were much more common in ancient, ancient and modern Palestine. In Judaism, we remember the turtle doves were long associated with the poor due to a Levitical law that allowed those without the means to substitute a turtle dove or a pair for lambs when they needed to make an offering at the temple. This, of course, was the case for Jesus' family, as detailed in the presentation at the temple in the Gospels. They did not have enough, and so they brought turtle doves. Now, in part from this connection and the way that the dove shows up when Jesus is baptized there at the River Jordan, there has been long an association not only of the, of the dove with the Spirit, but the dove with Jesus. Second century theologian Arrhenius linked the dove directly to Christ, pointing that the numerical value, and I know you all do this as well, the numerical value of the Greek letters that make up the word dove equal the same number of letters in alpha plus omega. So Christ and dove clearly are the same thing in his mind's eye. Mathematical theology ends the day. The dove, of course, in our account takes center stage here in Genesis. After the rains stop and the waters begin to subside, Noah turns to his winged companions, first sending off the raven who flies to and fro until the waters dry up. It's as if the wings of a raven are quieting the waters. And then the dove is sent out. First goes out and yet comes back, not finding land. It gets sent off again seven days later and comes back with that iconic olive leaf in its beak. And then finally it's sent off a third time and does not return. We assume that dove found solid ground. I wonder after finding that ground what our dove does next. Does she kiss the land like a, like a long-at-sea sailor of yore? Does she begin to forage? Does she begin to nest, to make a home, to make a place out of no place? Did you know the, the, the Hebrew meaning behind the word Noah? It is rest. Noah means rest. Now, nest, that, that rest is not only something that conveniently rhymes with nest, rest and nest, but it is also an essential part of the nest for the birds gather and they find the rest they need in order to bring about new life through the incubation process. So Noah can be thought of as a nester of sorts. Nesting is today's designated bird power and we want to consider it for how it may impact our own spiritual journeys in life. If you look at today's bulletin cover, you'll see a powerful image. Thank you, Brooks Matthewson, our photographer for our Lenten season, of the black-crowned night herons nesting. You can see that nesting is a careful process of many little steps. It requires the steps of flying, searching, gathering, returning, and building, going out and coming back. There's an ebb and a flow, a to and fro. It is hard work. It is self-giving. It requires discipline and awareness of surrounding and resources. It requires place. Have you ever held a bird's nest in your hand, perhaps in elementary school or at a nature center? There's a poem at the back of your bulletin written by Marianne Borach, which includes these lines, but in my hand it was intricate pleasure. Even the thorny reeds soften in the weave, deep life in another life. There is a sacredness and a power to a nest. 
The sociable weavers of South Africa build some of the largest nests on earth. They can sometimes house some 300 pairs of fellow birds, including multiple generations at once. From the sociable weaver, we friends might learn the power of warmth in community that comes intergenerationally. The ruby-throated hummingbird makes some of the smallest nests that we know of using soft materials, plants, and even spider webs, decorating them with lichens. Hummingbird nests are about the diameter of a quarter, and they have the amazing ability to expand as the hatched babies begin to grow, keeping things cozy and tight. From the hummingbird, we might learn the importance of flexibility and making space. The pied-billed grebe makes nests that float, building out of cattails, reeds, and aquatic vegetation. These floating nests actually give off heat from the decaying plants, which help the egg to incubate. From the grebe, we might remember creativity and the ability to find stability even in the midst of rising tides. Finally, the, the golden eagle's nests are massive, sometimes averaging five to six, wheat, wheat, five, five to six feet wide, two feet deep. The, the largest on record was 20 feet wide and eight and a half feet deep. From the eagle, we might, we might remember the refrain that there is nothing, there are, there are no heights, there are no nor depths that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our liberator. Friends, ultimately, nests are about bringing new life into play. Today is a great example of us nesting together as a community. It's been aforementioned, we have a lot going on in our community of faith. We are here, we are gathered first and foremost. That is a radical critique of radical individualism in our world. We come together because we find it is important to share with one another, to pray together, to sing together, to find oneness in our beautiful diversity. Second, we practice ritual together, baptism and communion. Baptism, we are cleansed and renewed and restored. Communion, we are nourished to go forward out into our world. Today, we will learn and lean into the practice of finding and crafting unshakable hope as we address the climate crisis. We need to learn together in order to be faithful in our world and face it. Together, we will go as a community to say our commonwealth deserves better justice for housing needs and for those facing this housing crisis. We advocate together all of these things seemingly little individually build together a more robust nest to weather the tides that are life. Friends, when we gather and follow that dove, we might be led into places where there is, of course, need and injustice. And like Jesus, we may be called to flip over the tables of wrong, we may be called to confront the sins of a climate-changing extractive capitalism or white supremacy or Christian nationalism. We may, like Jesus, be called into some holy anger. When the children in Palestine should be looking up to see doves and instead see bombs or food being dropped by the same U.S. government, shame on us as a country, shame on our world that is allowing this to happen. We should be gathering and conjuring anger in the face of these injustices. We need to push for ceasefire with every bone in our being as Jesus flipping over the tables of a marketplace in a holy place. Friends, too, Jesus' anger here, you notice, is different than the anger attributed to the God in the Noah story. That anger leads to total destruction, save the ark, the anger of Jesus leads to a new way and a new vision, a releasing of doves. Have you seen those artistic impressions of Jesus turning tables over with one hand and releasing from a cage doves from another? It's an incredible idea of Jesus releasing the doves, not just for ceremonial, asking for peace as we do often now in our culture, but Jesus releasing the doves, celebrating the work of liberation, and of jubilee, 
to which we are all called. Jesus is often linked to Jonah, the prophet, the one who was found for three days in the belly of that fish. We think of the tomb for three days, Jesus. We think of Jonah speaking words of prophetic confrontation to Nineveh, Jesus doing the same here to Jerusalem, to his fellow friends, to us today. The meaning of the Hebrew name Jonah is, of course, dove. Again, the connectedness here for us to be following the dove that is spirit, the dove that is prophet, the dove that is, of course, Jesus. Ultimately, friends, this call to follow the dove, who makes, of course, very simple, very simple nests in our world, sometimes nests in our gutters outside of churches and homes. The turtle dove, the morning dove, if we follow after their way is a way of impermanence, but it is also a way of finding and knowing our place. I would suggest to conclude that our bird power of nesting is an awareness of our place and an acceptance of it. Now, our place is not created equal. Some of us face much more difficult and challenging places in our world right now. Some of us are experiencing the traumas of aging, the traumas of injustice, the traumas of lack of housing. Some of us are experiencing hopelessness in different ways than others. But friends, all of us are in places in the world right now and that's the way it is. And I believe that God is calling us to an awareness of that place, to remember that in that place, the dove is with us. The dove, the sheltering and hovering God whose wings shadow us, does not lead us to face the place of challenge alone, but helps us to transform that place into the presence of the divine with us in part. March 1st this past week was St. David's Day, that 6th century bishop from Wales, now the patron saint of Wales, who is often depicted, of course, with a white dove on his shoulder. He is the great vegan saint linked only to eating. He and his monastery only ate leeks and drank water. They were humble. They focused on the simple things. They did not even use animals for agriculture. They plowed their own fields by hand. St. David is known as the one who called us to be joyful, to keep the faith, and to do the little things that you have heard and seen me do. Friends, if we do the same in whatever place we find ourselves, if we accept the little things, a smile from a stranger, two green lights in a row, a compliment, a healthy self-image thought, if we do the little things like read an inspiring poem or listen to a good song on a playlist, if we sip a warm cup of tea, if we hug a tree, if we notice a bird, if we say a prayer, if we take a breath, all of these little things combined, I believe, will craft the nests that will not only nurture us and hold us in the shadow of God's wing, but that nest will be wide enough to bring in all so that there is no more injustice. And so the tables of injustice can be finally flipped over for good, and there can be new life born, new gifts brought forward from our place. So friends, remember the language of the body once again. When we release doves, we lift our hands in praise. So the work of liberation is also the work of thanksgiving and praise to the God who is among us and with us. May we release doves and give thanks at the same time. In the name of Christ among us.